Who likes plants? Who thinks plants are the most boring thing on the planet? Who once thought plants are the most boring things on the planet until I actually learned more about them? See, so plants are actually quite interesting. Um, they're really boring on, to me on a surface level, if you are, or sorry, really interesting on a surface level. If you dig down into it and how they work, that's what bores me. And it took me a long time to get over that, that part to actually get over the, oh, they actually do some cool stuff part. So, um, that's basically what we're going to do. I'm going to try to teach you guys some cool things about plants since you're a little more excited about it than just the rest. So plants come in two different forms. And you guys may be familiar with this if you watch the last video. If not, that's totally fine. We have vascular and non-vascular plants. Anybody ever heard that term? Okay, if you haven't, that's totally fine. And it's going to make perfect sense in a second. Anybody ever heard of vascular tissue? If you've heard of it, it's besides A and T. So to us, it's like fat and things like that. But in plants, vascular tissue is what moves around food and water, okay? Some plants have it, some plants don't. Make sense? Cool. That's the two broad categories. The plants that have it and the plants that don't. The plants that have it are really tall for the most part, and the plants that don't have it are really tiny for the most part. Cool? And this is going to make sense why. Harking back to our talk about the uh, straw paper with the putting it in the glass and the water going up the straw paper, right? Remember all that? Water can only go up so far until the gravity starts to pull it back down, right? That's why plants that don't have vascular tissue can only be tiny, like grass and things like that. They don't have big tissues to pull, to pump. They don't have a pump, essentially, a heart, to pump stuff around inside of them. They have to rely on the concept of gravity and the, uh, to pull the water and stuff up. Makes sense from the, from the ground. So the roots suck the water up from the ground, goes up the plant via just the concept of adhesion and cohesion, just water moving up. And then gravity starts to pull it back down eventually, and the plants can only get about the A tall. Make sense, guys? Because gravity pulls the water down. Cool. Well, if you've got trees outside, they're quite big, right? They obviously somehow get water up to the tip top, right? They have a tissue called vascular tissue, which is specifically designed to move water around for them. Make sense? It's essentially a powered suction straw. Sucks water from the bottom all the way up to the tip top of the tree. Cool, right? Awesome, awesome. So far, so good? Cool. Now, if you're a thing like a, uh, a, a piece of grass, if you're teeny tiny and you're all green, right? We've talked about photosynthesis before, right? Green things are where the, the, is what makes the photosynthesis. Okay, it's got to be green, right? That whole blade of grass is green. The entire plant can get nutrients from the soil, sucking up from the roots, right? Water and things like that goes up to the tip top of the thing just by um, movement of water. And then the entire plant that's green can make photosynthesis, power, and make food for the entire plant. Make sense? All in one sales step. But your tree out there, it's got a trunk on it, right? That trunk's grass. That trunk's got living tissue in it, though, right? But it can't make its own food. It's not green. Does that make sense? It's not able to make food by photosynthesis. So what it has to do is it has to have the leaves, the green part, make food for it. Make sense? Cool. And then there's the type of tissue that brings the food from the root, from the leaves, the green part, down to the brown part and the roots to feed the rest of the plant. So, so far? Now, if you're a tiny little plant, you don't have vascular tissues, you can do it all at once. Make sense? You can make food for yourself and feed yourself all in the same little go because you're teeny tiny. You don't need those special tissues. Make sense? Your whole plant's going to be green. You can make food everywhere else. Cool? But vascular plants like our tree, its trunk can't make food, but its trunk's got to eat. So what happens is there's two types of tissue. You have something called the xylem and the phloem. Cool so far? So the xylem is the up tissue. It's going to suck water from the roots. It's going to suck nutrients from the soil. Oh, sorry, it's going to suck nutrients and water from the soil through the roots. Got to suck it up the root, suck it all the way up to the tip top of the tree, and disperse it all the way out through the branches into the leaves. All the water. Make sense? Essentially, just a powered suction cup that suck or suction that sucks water up and nutrients from the soil. Cool. That's called the xylem. X Y L E M. Cool so far. Very easy, hopefully. Okay. So now at the top, we have our leaves, the photosynthesis power plant. These solar panels, right? Charging up the batteries, and they're going to make the food for us. So they're going to take the water that that plant brought in and some oxygen and stuff, and change it around into some glucose. Cool, right? Well, they're going to keep a little bit of glucose for themselves because they have to eat. And whatever excess glucose that they have produced, they got a lot of it. They're going to send it back down through the rest of the plant. Make sense? So plants actually eat from the top.
top down. That's kind of weird, right? Do you guys think they suck up food from the ground? They don't. They actually eat from the top and they take it back down. Really strange, right? So they make their food in the leaves, the green part, and then what happens is all the excess sugar is sent back out into the other by, uh, vascular tissue called the phloem. P-H-L-O-E-M. Cool? So the xylem sucks stuff up, the phloem sends stuff back down. Cool so far? Okay. So the xylem sucks the water nutrients up, the leaves turn it into some sugars and goodies, and then the phloem is going to take all the excess sugars and send it right back down to the very bottom of the plant, all the way into the root. Because the root's got to eat too, right? But they're underneath the ground, they can't get sunlight, so they got to eat. Cool? So along the way, all the sugars are going to seep out into the plant and feed the rest of the plant, all the cells along the way. So it gets to the very bottom and whatever's left as well. Makes sense so far, guys? Pretty easy, hopefully, right? Anybody ever knock the bark off of a tree? It's called gurgling. You guys know what I'm talking about? You ever gurgled a tree or seen a tree that's been gurgled? And the bark comes off of it all the way around in a circle. If you guys don't know what I'm talking about, they, they do this occasionally. Uh, you hit a tree with your lawnmower, you might do it, scrape all the bark off, and you, got, you can see the white underneath. And then most of the time, if you do it all the way around the tree, gurgling, the tree will die. You guys know what I'm talking about? The tree dies. And this is why. The xylem is on the inside of the tree. That's the wood part. Make sense? The phloem sits just underneath the bark. So when you cut the tree off, the bark off, you cut the phloem off. So the tree can suck up nutrients all day long, suck up water and stuff. It goes all the way up to the tip top, and it's made, 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 turned into sugar. Sit right back down, and then all of a sudden, the bark's gone. Makes sense? No more flow to carry it to the rest of the tree. And the sugars and stuff just ooze out into the ground, into the ground, to the, onto the, the rest of the bark. Makes sense? And the plant can't eat it. The roots don't get any food, and the plant starves from the bottom down. Makes sense? That's what happens when you gurgle a tree if you cut the bark off. It can't get any food because the food goes right underneath the bark. Very strange, right? You'd think it would go the other way. That's not how plants work. Really weird, right? Cool so far on that? Concept of what vascular tissues are. Got the xylem that sucks up water, nutrients, and the phloem that sends down chicken. Cool so far? Okay, so we got two different broad categories. Our vascular plants and our non-vascular plants. Cool so far? Uh, our non-vascular plants are going to be okay. these guys that are mosses. You guys are familiar with moss if you've ever looked outside ever in your entire life, right? There are billions of different species of moss. Oh, you can come in tons of different billions of them. But they're all very teeny, teeny, tiny. Makes sense? They're not very tall. You guys are probably familiar with it more like that. They're very short and very small. Makes sense? They can't grow very tall because they don't have vascular tissue. They have to rely on water and gravity to be able to suck them, to feed them, to suck the water. Makes sense? You have to rely on gravity to feed the plant. Can't get very tall when you guys know how far water goes up its stomach. Cool? So these are, are your non-vascular plants. There's only one group of them, and that's your mosses. So far, so good? Pretty easy on that? Okay, so mosses are very interesting. Mosses work like this, guys. So your moss, here's the ground, and your moss doesn't really have roots. You guys know that? It doesn't really have roots. It has something called a rhizome. And it's simply just kind of this little weird underground sort of little hole in the back. Kind of. It doesn't really suck up nutrients or anything. It just kind of holds them to the ground. Make sense? Cool. And on top of that, you have what you guys would call the moss plant. The green part. So far, so good? Okay. And that's your stereotypical moss. Pretty easy. Well, moss comes in two forms. You got your regular moss, and then you got this big, tall pokey up in the stem, right? You see that? That's the same plant. That's the non-reproductive form, and that's the reproductive form. You guys remember our mushroom? When we have fungi, we still we have uh, the fungi underneath the ground, even though it might not be reproducing, right? And when it's reproducing, you see the mushroom. But the fungus is still there, even though it might not be reproducing. Make sense? Non-reproductive form. Then it's reproducing, and those little things come out. Make sense so far? Those little critters are called capsules, setae, or things like that, stalks. Cool? Now, what they're going to do is they're going to come up like this. When the moss is ready to reproduce, and at the top of them, 
fits this little capsule and it's essentially an egg cell. It's called the bunch of tiny little baby mosquitoes inside it. Cool. When it's mature, the capsule's going to burst open. All the little spores will float out. They're not seeds. They're not seeds. They're spores. It's just that essentially that is a baby moth that just seeds. It's just that it's not a seed. It doesn't have to germinate. It doesn't grow roots. It just lands and grows into a moth. Cool. It's not a seed. That's our big deal of a plant. This is a primitive baby plant. Like, what kind of first evolved plant life? Makes sense? The little spores will land somewhere, start their little cold bath, and then start a main moth. Well, so far, how that works? Pretty simple, right? They're really teeny tiny. They don't have vascular tissue. They're basically just primitive, primitive plants. Cool? This is the other interesting thing about these guys. Now, I'm going to talk about this in a little bit called alteration of generation. Okay? Plants are super weird. This is super confusing, and if it's okay, that's totally fine. Cool. I'm going to do my best. We have two forms of plants, which you can see here, moths, right? This is called a sporophyte, and this is called a gametophyte. This guy makes the gametes. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. I switched that around. This is a sporophyte. This is a gametophyte. The mouth, moth is the only one inside there. So this is a gametophyte. It doesn't matter. I'll switch it inside. This guy makes sperm and egg. This guy makes spores. Sperm and egg. Spores. Sexual reproduction, asexual reproduction. Sexual reproduction, asexual reproduction. Make sense on how that works, guys? It's very, very strange. You can't do that. You only have sexual reproduction, right? They do both. It's very weird. So it's called alteration of generation. One that's sexual, one that's non sexual. Make sense so far? Almost all plants do this. Cool? really strange. So you have two forms of the same plant existing at the same time. They don't look anything alike, do they? In fact, for the most part, the gametophytes and the sporophytes of plants look so drastically different that most people would think they're separate species. Okay? In fact, trees have good sporophytes. Did you guys know that? They're about this big. And they live inside of a tree. It's really weird. Plants are very exceptionally strange. Cool? We're not going to go so super hard on, de on detail on that, but you get the idea so far. Cool? Okay. So plants. This is another reason why plants are super, super, super primitive. Okay? The moss in particular. These guys. It can't reproduce. It can't reproduce by itself. Okay? You guys are familiar with pollen, right? Pollen is not, it, I'll, I'll explain how pollen works later. But pollen is essentially a, a, an envelope that carries plants around. Cool? These guys don't make pollen. They make sperm, but they don't make pollen. Cool so far? So sperm and pollen is blowing around in the wind, right? If you don't make pollen, how are you going to get your sperm from place to place? Well, they have to rely on water. Does that make sense, guys? If you've ever paid attention to moths, they almost always live in a moist um, environment, wet kind of humid environment. Make sense? And this is why. When a moth plant is ready to reproduce, it has to have a mo moist, uh, wet environment. So what's going to happen is one little moth plant over here is going to have an egg. And this little moth plant over here is going to make some sperm. Cool. Now in a fun world, you could fly around in the air via pollen and pollinate one another. But in the moth world, you can't because you're primitive and you haven't evolved very much. So the sperm is going to swim to the egg via the water. The moisture. Sense? What? The moisture. Yep, via the moisture, water drops. Make sense, guys? It's got to have water to swim through. You can't swim through the air. Isn't that why, mo why moths collect so much moisture yep. whenever it's... Okay. Partly, yep. So they, since guys, they also drink that way. They don't have roots. They can't suck up water from the soil, so they drink from water just being absorbed through. And since guys, that's another reason why they collect so much water. Cool so far? Very, very, very primitive. They can't do anything fancy. Cool so far? So what you're seeing here is the gametophyte, this little guy, is going to produce the sperm and egg. Cool? The sperm is going to swim to the egg, and wherever they unite at, you have your different form of a moth for these things. Cool? The sporophyte. This, if you guys remember how sexual reproduction works, right? You have half chromosome from your mom, half chromosome from your dad. You guys remember that? Remember the abbreviation N? You guys recall from biology, you went from one end. One end, so half the number of chromosomes in the sperm and egg, they unite and form a 
different form of a moss. So so far, essentially a fertilized egg. But instead of developing into a new moss, like you would think it would, it develops into this thing. That makes more copies of what it is now. Make sense? So you have one of these that makes sperm and egg, that's haploid, and then one of them that makes diploid, sort of, asexual reproduction. Sexual, sperm and egg, they unite to form an asexually reproducing structure. Makes sense? Very strange, super weird. If this is kind of murky, that's okay. Cool? Does it make some sort of sense at all? If it doesn't, that's, that's okay. Cool? As long as you need to be aware of sperm and egg, one form produces sperm and egg, they unite, the sperm and egg form another form that makes sperm. Cool? Pretty easy so far, and hopefully. That's moss. Easy. They are very, very, very limited in where they can grow because they have to have a moist environment. You don't find mosses in the desert because they have to have water to swim their sperm and eggs to get, to get, to get together. Cool. They're very limited in where they can grow. Mosses are very small because they don't have vascular tissues and limited in their global distribution based on where it's a moist environment. Cool. They're very, very primitive. You guys get that, right? They are reliant on water. Things that are, we're relying on water too, if you think about it, but we carry our water with us. If you've ever had your water break, you carry your water with you. Make sense? They don't. The more reliant you are on the environment, the more primitive you are. The more reliant you are on yourself to do everything, the more evolutionarily advanced you are. Make sense on that? Makes sense if you think about it. Cool so far? Pretty easy on mosses. Kind of neat though, right? You guys didn't know they were probably two different forms of moss. Or let alone two different forms. Pretty easy on that? Okay. So our next group up, we're going to take a jump up from plants that don't have vascular tissue to plants that do. And the plants that do are going to start out with what you guys are familiar with as ferns. You guys are familiar with ferns, right? If you've ever watched a dinosaur video ever in your entire life, the entire world back then was covered in ferns. Make sense? It also makes sense if you think about it, because they're the next step up evolutionarily speaking from moss. They're basically the same as moss, but they have vascular tissue. Make sense, guys? That's it. They're tall moss. But other than that, realistically, it's the same. They're relying on water. They have no root system. They have that underground system, the little rhizome system that holds them to the ground. They have primitive roots. Um, but it's just, they're just very primitive. They have a very, they have a, oh, sorry, they have a main root. This is the difference between these guys. They have one big giant root, the little root that's coming down. And then anywhere along the root, the, spur, the uh, sperm can sprout up above the ground. Make sense? So big one giant root that they all share. If you've ever tried to yank up a fern, you know what I'm talking about. They all come up in one giant root. Um, also, if you've ever gone out into the woods and you've seen ferns covering up things the size of this entire uh, room, that's probably one plant. Not a bunch of them. Just one plant with its all big shared main root system. It's kind of cool, right? So, not a lot of a step up. It's all connected, it all shares one big giant root system, still dependent on water, still doesn't have seeds, it makes spores again, and the sperm and eggs unite to make spores, still very, very primitive. Makes sense? But it's a bit bigger. So it's getting there. Cool? So ferns are super cool. The way that ferns work, if you've ever seen a fern growing in the, wo in the world, um, you might see something like this. You got the fern leaf, and then in the middle of the fern, you see something kind of like this around the bottom. You guys have ever seen those before? They're curled up kind of around the bottom of the ferns and stuff, so you got the leaves poking up and then occasionally you'll have those. So if you ever look at a fern in the wild, or you might see these on your Boston fern at your grandma's house or something at Home Depot, these are called fiddleheads. Okay, so you can kind of see why they look like this curled up violin. Because if you've ever seen a violin. That's a baby uh, leaf for a fern. Anywhere along the ground, underneath their underground shared root system, the little fiddlehead can pop up. Make sense? Anywhere along it, it's the one big giant root, anywhere along it can happen. Cool. The little fiddlehead will poke itself through the ground, and essentially what that is is it's a, a fern leaf that somebody rolled up into a little ball. Make sense? And as it matures, it will unroll itself. Make sense? And as it's maturing, the leaves on the side that are all folded up will also open up, and then you have a full fern leaf as it goes. Cool? 
You can eat those, so fiddleheads are highly edible. Um, people go harvest this, um, they sell them for salads and stuff, they're pretty good salad toppings from what I've heard. You have to boil them though to eat them. Um, they have a lot of fluids and fat and deep junky stuff inside of them. Um, and if you don't boil them, all that stuff can make it, uh, if you're, you get the swimming and clogged up on the inside. So you have to boil them once, or blanch them, I guess, and then you can eat them. But apparently they're really good. Cool tomorrow night, guys. Still pretty primitive, a little bit bigger, no seed, silver line on water. Got a real root system here, but a very primitive one, and that's about it. Cool. Not very fancy. But we're going to take a next step up on our uh, world of plant evolution to these guys. Things that have seeds. Make sense, guys? And seeds are a big deal. When you have a seed, you don't have to worry about living in a wet environment anymore, right? You guys ever seen a fern growing in the desert? There's one species of them that grow in the desert. It's called a resurrection plant. You can probably figure out why it's called a resurrection plant, given the name. It dries up for hundreds of years, and then whatever little rain comes out, it just goes back to life again for about five minutes, and then it dies. So it goes back to sleep. Makes sense? So there's a very few of them, but the most of them live in the rainforest and things like that, because they have to have water for their sperm and eggs to move. Cool? When you have something like this, a seed, or pollen, you don't need water. You can go wherever you dang well please. Make sense? All you need is the air, basically. Cool? And this is our step up from basically plants that are stuck in the very limited environment to wherever we want to go from. Cool? And our first step is things called gymnosperm. Okay? Gymnosperm, sperm, as you guys can probably figure out, means seed. Okay? Gymno means mute. Or actually, sperm means vessel. Cool. So it's a mewed vessel. Makes sense. It's got no protective host, no fruit. It's a naked little seed. And you guys are familiar with it if you've ever seen a sunflower seed sitting on a table. Makes sense. And then our next step up are plants that make fancy little things and fruits and flowers and stuff. And that's our next step up, called angiosperm. That means vessel within a protection. Fruits within a protection. Makes sense. Protected vessels. Make sense? Also, the word gym comes from gymnasium, where people used to work out naked. So, huzzah, got a little etymology lesson for today. Alright, fun on that. Okay, so let's talk about pine trees. Cool. Gymnosperm. You guys are familiar with those as conifers. Make sense? So, evergreens, usually what those are called. Um, evergreens are going to be our next step up the evolutionary ladder because they have vascular tissue quite large vascular tissues, if you guys can see, if you guys have ever seen palm pine trees outside, they're huge. Um, so, they have vascular tissue, and they have true seeds, and that's a big deal here. Makes sense? The ability to not produce um, spores is a big deal. Cool. Why might spores be a bad deal? Why would we not want to produce spores? They're dependent on the wind to move them around, they get squished, they're very weather, not particularly weather resistant. Makes sense, guys? So they're not the most useful things ever. But seeds, they got a little coating, right? Not only that, things like to eat them. That's a big thing, right? They're nice and tasty and nutrient full. So if something likes to eat you, they're going to carry you around with you and poop you out somewhere else. Makes sense? You guys ever heard of the keystone species? We'll talk about them a little later in this class. Something that without, the without that one species in the environment, the whole world would fall apart. In New Zealand, one of those is the cassowary bird. You guys know what I'm talking about? The big giant killer turkeys, the murder turkeys? They eat fruit seeds of fruit trees. It's about the only thing on the entire island of New Zealand that does that. And they carry them around and poop them place to place. And without the cassowary birds to do that, the entire island would essentially not function. Make sense? So, seeds are really nice because it allows you a nice protective way to get from place point A to point B. And you might be able to go thousands of miles in the form of a coconut or something like that. Make sense? So seeds are a really big deal. We like seeds. Seeds are a wonderful thing. And that's why plants evolve them. Makes sense? It takes a lot of time and a lot of effort to produce something like a seed or a fruit. They wouldn't do that if they didn't have an advantageous rooting system. Makes sense? So it evolves because it's highly beneficial for reproduction. Makes sense? Awesome, awesome. So, pine trees, gymnosperm, are naked seed-bearing plants. These guys are traditional plants in the sense of, I'm going to erase all this, cool? Okay, so our pine tree. This is a little worse to read. Okay, so your pine tree, you got your basket, and you got your pine tree 
the roots underneath the crown, and the tree comes up. You guys are familiar with all that, right? All that gives you a stereotypical stuff, right? Okay. So in your normal stereotypical tree that has got vascular tissue in it, and your ferns that have vascular tissue in it, the green's up at the top, right? And the brown, where there's no food, is in the middle. Cool. The xylem runs from the root all the way up the middle of the tree. All the way out to the leaves and stuff in the branch. And the phloem sits right underneath the bark, literally right underneath it. And it goes all the way that way. It's just that it only sits right underneath the layer of the bark. It's not found in the middle of the tree. Cool. If you guys have ever cut a tree in half and it's hollow sometimes, that's, okay, that's why. Because the middle of the tree doesn't have anything inside of it in this case. Okay? So what happens is every year as the tree grows, it's going to add one new layer of phloem on the outside, a new layer of bark, and a new layer of xylem on the inside. Makes sense? So it gets bigger, like this. And it adds another ring. And it adds another ring. And that's what makes rings in trees. Makes sense? Every year they grow a brand new ring of xylem first, and then they'll grow another ring of phloem on the outside. And that's what you get the light band and the dark band. The dark band's the phloem, the light band's the xylem. Makes sense? However much they grow, you get big xylem or big phloem. If they grow a little bit, you get a little xylem and a little phloem. Makes sense? Every year they grow a different ring. Cool so far? And then eventually what happens is the middle of the tree is going to get so big, they don't need the nutrients in there, they kill the middle of the tree. It's just wasteful to feed it. Makes sense? They don't need to do that. So the middle of the tree will die. Cool. They send a bunch of uh, lignin pigments and stuff that just make it hard. Um, if you guys have ever left wood outside for a couple years, it gets harder to rot. You guys know what I'm talking about? Essentially, the same thing happens to the inside of the tree. They just kill it. And it gets really, really hard in the middle. It's not alive anymore. The xylem and the phloem just sit on the outside. And it doesn't matter. That's why you can have hollow tree. Makes sense? The active stuff that's alive is on the outside, not in the middle. Weird, right? So the bigger the tree, the more likely the inside is going to be cool, right? Cool so far? Awesome. A uh, function of a tree in a nutshell. Your angiosperm tree, flowering trees do the same thing. Probably. So let's talk about how these guys reproduce. These guys have seeds. Big step up, right? If you got seeds, you got to do something special with them. You got to make one of those seeds, right? So let's talk about how we make them. Basically, it's the exact same concept. They have angiosperms, or sorry, our gymnosperms have a, a, the alteration of generation slide cycle, except in this case, you can't see the gametophyte. Trees are sporophytes. That's what you're looking at. Make sense, guys? You can't see the gametophyte in trees. They're so teeny tiny. They're basically just parasites, and they live on the inside of the pine tree. You can't see them. Make sense, guys? They're teeny, teeny tiny, and they don't really look like pine trees. Cool. Uh, I, if I didn't know they existed, just from somebody telling me, I probably wouldn't believe them. But they do exist. Cool. So what's going to happen is our pine tree is going to produce the gametophyte on its actual leaf. And that's where the eggs come in. The sporophyte, sorry, the gametophyte, the male gametophyte, and I'm going to blow your mind in a second. As I saw, didn't know plants had genders, did they? Plants have genders. They have male and female. Some plants have both, some plants are not. Some plants have separate. Very strange. But they do. Mosses, it's both. You're male and female. You're a hermaphrodite mosses. But trees and bigger plants, sometimes they're hermaphrodite, sometimes they aren't. You have designated male, designated female trees. And they produce either sperm or egg. Part can do both. Cool. They're usually going to be uh, uh, hermaphrodites, so they produce gametophyte or egg and sperm. Cool. The technical term for that is dioecious. Di meaning two, eicious meaning reproduction. Sorry, monoecious, sorry. Monoecious. One. Meaning one to reproduce. Cool. Dioecious is two, what we would be. We would be a dioecious tree. Cool. Monoecious, one to reproduce. Cool. So, what they do is for these guys, you have male and female on the same tree. Cool. They can sometimes self-pollinate with themselves. Not always. Most of the time, they're going to rely on somebody else. Is this a male cone or a female? You guys know? That's a female cone. This is a sugar leaf cone from out west in California. It's why it's so big. This is probably what you guys are a little more familiar with. Your white pine cone. The ones around here. Little fat ones, right? Cool. That's a male pine cone. You guys ever seen those before? That's 
to males. This is where the pollen is going to come from. Cool? So male pine cone and female pine cone. Great thing, right? That's the gender of the pine cone. Be sure you can identify that on your lab exam. Cool? So this produces eggs. This produces sperm. Make sense of how that works? Cool? Now, what in reality is going on here is this is producing lots of pollen. You guys have probably taken these before and done this with it. I know I did this a billion times when I was a little kid. You got pollen all over my hands. It's pollen. Cool? But pollen should this. Pollen is a delivery system for plant sperm. Cool? Inside of each little teeny tiny pollen grain, there's billions of them on there. Contain sperm cells. Cool? That's what they have inside of them. You guys need this. So they have sperm cells inside of them. That's kind of weird, right? Kind of strange to think about. So the male portion, this four gametophyte over here, produced our male pollen plant cone, which made all of our pollen with the sperm. Cool. The gametophyte made the game. Okay. Cool. The exact same thing happened over here, except the gametophyte over here led to the pollen cone. Cool. And on each one of these tiny little uh, things, you guys know the little uh, pine cone cones? I don't know sure what they call those. Scales? That's the term. Scales. On each of the little scales, down on the inside of it, there's actually a beautiful picture of this I'll show you along here. Let's cut a pine cone in half this way. And that's what you're looking at. Kind of makes sense what you're seeing here. first produced, it's closed up. You guys have seen that before, right? Cool. Inside of it are little tiny eggs that sit right down here in the inside, basically on the, the points of where the little scales are, is an egg. Make sense? As this thing matures, the eggs are going to slightly mature, swell up a little bit, and it'll start to open. Make sense? Cool. As it opens, now it's open to the environment for pollen to land on. Does that make sense so far? Cool. This is where things get weird with plants. So, the little pollen is going to find a pine cone. It's sitting around in the world somewhere, and there's our little pine cone scale, and our little egg sits right here. Cool. Our little pollen grain is going to be floating around in the world, and it's going to land about right here on our pollen grain, on our, 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 our pine cone. Cool. What's going to happen next is that little pollen grain is going to produce something called a pollen tube. It's a giant, long, hollow tube that goes from the pollen all the way down across the um, uh, scale, all the way down inside and penetrates the actual egg. Cool. Then what's going to happen is once that occurs, the sperm will swim from the um, pollen down the little pollen tube and into the egg. Cool. Then the egg becomes fertilized, hooray, hooray, and then it starts to grow and develop into a seed. Make sense? As it grows and develops, it gets bigger and swells up, which causes the pine cone to become more and more open. Make sense how this works? And then eventually what will happen is your seed will become fully formed, the pine cones will be fully open, and then they'll fly along and work with it to eat them, whatever, and take them away from it. Cool. And then the little seed can go land somewhere and actually start a brand new sporophyte which then makes more babies and then so on and so on. Our process starts to build up. Interesting, huh? Do you guys know plants for that fancy? Plants are quite fancy, huh? So, does this make sense how that works? So technically, when you guys get pollen all over your car, it's probably your plant sperm. So it's kind of fun, right? Okay. Um, also, how many of you guys are allergic to plant sperm? So fun, right? Yeah. So, cool so far on this? Okay. Um, makes sense. Pretty easy. Pollen doesn't show up in the fossil record until a very specific time, and that's basically when we know these, these things start to show up. Because prior to that, we see only spores. Makes sense? So it, it's not just like, oh, we just got to guess when these things evolved. It's because you look at the fossil record and there's just no seed. <laughs> there's no plant sperm, and then there's nothing but spores. And then once the other ones start to show up, you start to think, oh, okay, something happened here. And that's how we know this stuff. Cool. Okay. Fairly easy.
crazy so far? Okay. So this is our gymnosperm. Now the difference between a gymnosperm and an angiosperm is the second that these guys unite, seed grows. Okay? You got a seed with a hard shell on it. It's basically what you got. Makes sense? Very soft, little squishy, or sorry, bungeable things. It's pretty easy to get lost to the environment. It's just sitting there open on a pine cone. Make sense? You guys ever pulled the seeds out of pine cones before? If you've ever had, uh, if you grew up on a farm like I did, they're everywhere. I think they're quite easy. But so you can pull the seeds out of them. Make sense? They're little tiny, wingy little critters. You throw them in there and they kind of spin around like the propeller, mm -hmm. but not the same thing. Similar, but not. <laughs> but, so does that make sense so far, guys? Very, very weak stuff. So it's got its advent, uh, it's, 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 uh, advantages to it. I don't have water anymore. I can use the wind to pollinate me, bugs, whatever, right? Um, but I'm still stuck um, relying on something else to do it for me. Makes sense? And I'm stuck on the wind, basically, for the gymnosperm, and my seeds aren't protected. If it lands somewhere and something steps on it, it's going to get squished or broken, or the environment can burn it, the sun can burn it. Makes sense, guys? It's, it's, it's going to have no nutrients when it lands. That's basically what a seed's for, by the way. It's a seed, or a, a fruit. It's a seed of developing plants when it's growing. They don't have that. Makes sense, guys? So they, they have a, it's, it's a step up the evolutionary ladder, but it's not the same. So far, but that's our gymnosperms, our naked plants. And our next step up is an angiosperm, plants with fruits. All right, so fruits are flowers, I should say, fruits and flowers. A flower is our big deal here, okay? Pine cones, you ever seen a flower on a pine tree? They don't make it. They just make this that makes your pollen. Make sense? Plants that make flowers, they're fancy. And they can do everything at once. Make sense? They're fancy. They're, they're a step up to the team of the evolutionary ladder, and they're going to make sperm and eggs together for the most part. Cool. Most plants have the ability to do both together that make flowers, but not all of them. Cool. But plants that make flowers also develop fruit. You ever seen a pine cone fruit? They don't have it. They have seeds, little dry seeds. What's the evidence? What's the point of a fruit, guys? Why does a fruit make sense? Over something like that little dry seed. Exactly. Things want to eat it, right? You want to eat an apple. And when you eat an apple, you're more likely to eat the fruit, the seeds inside, right? Probably not going to go eat these. These aren't great appetizers. Cool. And as you also said, it protects the fruit, or the seed, right? The seed inside. This falls on the ground and gets stepped on, it's going to squish, right? Mm -hmm. You guys step on an apple, you're probably not going to break the seeds inside. Cool. In fact, they fall off the trees all day long. Makes sense? So, fruits are really useful. Especially in the case of things that live on, you know, like islands, like I mentioned, like a coconut. That coconut floats, right? That's a fruit. It floats. You can travel from here, you know, the middle of nowhere in uh, uh, Australia on the ocean just by floating, and that happens a lot. Coconuts get from place to place. So seeds uh, with fruits on them are very useful over seeds that don't have fruit. Makes sense. If you're just a little naked seed chilling out with no protection, it's not so handy. But Things with protection, good. Also things want to eat and carry air around. Cool. So plants with fruits are awesome. So this is how fruits work. You guys have seen a flower before, right? At least I sure hope so. This is the ovule down here, this little round part. 
an ovary in the middle, this part right here, and then the actual egg on the side. Cool. Those little eggs will develop into seeds once it becomes fertilized. Okay, so far? Okay. Pretty easy. Cool. Okay, so this can happen to yourself or some other plant, depending on who you are or how your species work. But eventually what's going to happen is the male pollen is going to be mature and be released into the world. Cool. Now what can happen is you can stick on the head of an insect, a bug, a bee, you can float around in the wind, whatever. Somehow you're going to end up right there. Okay. One of those little pollen grains is going to be delivered right here to the top of the female portion of that plant. Cool. Now you guys know insects do this a lot, right? They come up, they drink the nectar, the nectar's down in here. And the nectar essentially is to just attract them to get pollen stuck to their head. Make sense? And then they go drink nectar from the next plant and deliver pollen to the female plant. That's pretty neat, right? That's basically what they that's what bees are going for. Make sure you guys are following Cool. That's what they're cleaning. That's the whole job of bees. There are quite a few species of plants that rely on nothing but birds to do this. And Triboro cactuses rely on bats, which is pretty neat. Um, big giant cactus is that way. So lots of different plants rely on different species to do this work. That's why taking care of our entire environment is important because you never know who's relying on what. Make sense? So anyway, the little pollen is gonna end up at the male from the male portion onto the top of the female portion somehow. Most of the time, it's not going to be self-pollinated. It easily could just float over there, but that's usually not what's going to happen. Makes sense? Usually it'll come from somewhere else. And then what is our little pollen grain going to develop? Same thing I developed earlier. Our pollen tube! You guys remember that? Little pollen tube is going to go all the way down into here. And the pollen is going to release its sperm, and the little sperm is going to swim all the way down and fertilize. Yeah. Make sense so far? Cool. And now what's going to happen as our eggs start to develop and grow is the plant parts are going to start to fall away. The petals are going to be displaced as the ovule swells and grows. Cool so far? The anthers and stamen are going to be displaced as the plant grows. And then eventually, the fruit is going to be fully developed in the middle where the seeds are. It's now fully developed and ready to be um, exposed to the environment and grow into another plant. And you'll see at the top where it was originally attached to the plant. Does that look familiar? What is that? An apple. That's an apple. Make sense so far, guys? That's how apples work. And if you've ever seen an apple, you've got the part at the top where it was attached to stem. And then at the bottom, you got the little things at the bottom where the original part is. That's how it works. Kind of neat, right? That's how fruits work. Different fruits form different ways, but that's basically how they all form. Cool. Now, if you're a fruit like this, this is called a simple fruit. Make sense, guys? One pollen, one ovule, one fruit. Cool. Now, something like a strawberry has lots of different apples, lots of put together. You guys ever seen a strawberry seed before, a strawberry flower? If you look at it up close in the middle, it looks like this. It's white with little things floating around on the side, and it's got these all these little tiny yellow things in the middle of it, kind of like a dandelion. All of those are individual little versions of this. Make sense? All of them will be fertilized at once. They all swell up, and then when they all swell up, they stick to each other, and they start to grow on top of one another, and that's a strawberry. Make sense, guys? That's why all the little seeds are on the outside. All those little individual seeds come from individual flowers. That all just got happen to be fertilizers. Our individual uh, eggs. Weird, right? And then you've got things like blackberries, which have different seeds, but since their ovules work like this. And then the pollen come in and separate them out, and then they're fed, and then everything grows together. That's why you have the little balls put together. That's one of the blackberries. And then you get even weirder when you get something like a pineapple, which is smushed all together. If you've ever caught a pineapple and have it got leaves in the middle of it, you know what I'm talking about? You have the, the rings in a pineapple, those are actually leaves. That's the type of way that fruits put together. But they're all basically just the same thing. It's different variations of it. This is one or multiple ones pushed together in different ways. If you're a single, this is called a simple fruit. 
if your how long you call it aggregate to multiple file requests per second. Super weird, but hopefully kind of cool, right? Then you text it. That's how things work. Hooray, right? right? Okay. Make sure we covered everything. Okay. There's the real world of it, how that works. Make sense so far, guys? So the rules for this, my, my, this is my drawing makes sense. You guys probably want to pay attention to the anatomy of this for your lab exam. Cool. Good question might be, how does the pollen go from point A to point B to fertilize? Or something like that. Cool. Where does the pollen land? The blah, blah, blah. Cool. Something along those lines. This is the real version of what I just drew on the board. This thing will swell up, displace the petals. The petals will fall off. These little things down here are called sepals. That's the bottom of the apple, the little part at the bottom that you see. And then you got the stem at the top. Makes sense? Kind of neat, right? That's an iris. Yeah, that's an iris. Yes. Or, or lily, sorry, lily. Um, that's, the, that's the stereotypical one is a lily. The, the tiger lily. Not the lily. Makes sense? Cool. Some plants have just the male portion, some have just the female. The vast majority of flowering plants have both. Cool. Not all. You guys are going to be familiar with these guys um, for basically every tree that you're familiar with, in, other than pine trees. Um, these guys don't have defined genders, but you can see the male and female are on both trees, or on both plants. Makes sense. Pine, uh, poplar trees, you guys know what I'm talking about, oak trees, they have flowers, they're just teeny, teeny tiny. Makes sense, guys. These poplar trees have big, large tulip poplar flowers, and it's the state name, tulip poplar, um, our state tree. So it kind of depends on the tree. Um, oak tree flower, you might not even know that. Makes sense? Cool, but they are there. Um, that's where acorns come from. Cool. So different types of things produce different types of critters, but they're all basically the same thing. Um, you guys might be familiar with these guys in some ways you might not think about. Most of our angiosperms are going to be dioecious. Makes sense? Both plants, or you need, uh, sorry, monies. One plant can be both. Most of our gymnosperms are going to be over now. Kind of weird. Um, you guys ever seen a ginkgo tree? You guys know what I'm trees? They're usually used around landscaping. The uh, leaves look like this. Yeah, the little lines that run in them. They're green, they're kind of like heart band. Um, and then they turn really, really, really beautiful golden yellow, like the color of your tea cake um, in, the, in the fall. Makes sense? You guys ever seen those? If you haven't, start looking for them. They use them a lot for landscaping in towns and stuff because they're beautiful. Only if you get a male one. Because the female trees produce really, really, really smelly cones. Makes sense? They have produced cones that look like regular pine cones, except they're kind of surrounded by a little protective barrier. So they're a little, kind of a little step up a little bit, but they're cones on the inside. Um, but the little protective barrier is made of something called eukaryotic acid. I guess you guys are familiar with that, so it gives rotten eggs and rotten milk it smells. Uh, really sorry, rotten milk, rotten cheese, rotten dairy products, eukaryotic acid. So if you get that on your shoes or something, it just doesn't come off. Get a female one in your landscaping area, it's just nasty. Um, so if you ever want to buy one, they're beautiful, but make sure you get male trees. Cool. Because females are really gross. Males don't produce those, so they only produce males. Pretty easy so far, guys. Some sort of neat, hopefully. Or at least some sort of. I think I'm trying to make this not just look at slides and be boring. Sorry. Um, okay, so let's talk about our last little bit here. So far, so good on this. Okay. So, one little big difference between our plants that have seeds in there, or plants that have fruit and seeds. Well, plants that have seeds, just are naked seeds, they have something called single fertilization. Cool. Our other ones have something called double fertilization. Now, I don't particularly care if y'all know this or not, but one sperm cell is gonna fertilize the individual little eggs, makes sense? And another sperm cell is going to fertilize something called the endocarp, the mesosperm. Essentially what that is, is that's going to develop into our actual fruit. Make sense? That's going to develop into the actual fruit part. The seeds in the middle are going to develop from one couple of sperms, and the thing in the middle is going to develop into the actual fruit part, what we eat. Make sense? And that's going to provide nutrients for the developing seeds. Cool. It's going to feed them once they fall off. It's also going to help the uh, seeds develop and grow. It's going to provide them food. So one sperm, sperm, uh, one sperm fertilizes the food source, and the other sperm fertilizes the actual egg. Make sense? Cool how that works? Very strange for plants. Cool so far? Just FYI. All right, our last little bit. 
plant it could be broken up into two different forms other than just if you have uh, vascular tissue or not if you produce seeds or not and things like that and this part is really 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 easy this is kind of the broad categories other than vascular tissue is if you are a monopod or a dipod if you're a dipod or a monopod, it does not matter. You might not be a vascular plant. You might not be a non-vascular plant. It does not matter. They come in both different forms. Okay, this is essentially just the other category. Cool. So, the way this one works. Plants. You guys have all done the little experiment, or at least seen it, where you uh, grow a lima bean in a bag at school, and then the little lima bean comes up with a little leaf on top. Okay, so, you've got the little lima bean down here, and you got this. Right? And then you guys have all seen grass grow before, right? At least I hope so. And it looks like this. Make sense so far? I used the words mono and dialogue, right? Yeah. What do you think that might refer to? One or two. Exactly! Huzzah! Okay, so let's go here. So, cotyledon. That's the fancy word for seed leaf. Okay? Plants have to make food the second that they grow. That makes sense if you think about it, right? You can't just start to grow and not make leaves. If you don't have anything to make food with, I mean leaves, you're going to starve to death, right? You gotta have a solar panel to start with. Cool. You can't be growing and then make your solar panel. You gotta have your solar panel to start with to continue to power yourself. That's just the word going. So what happens is seeds have their original solar panel crawled up inside of them. Make sense, guys? Now, if you got one solar panel or two, that's where the categories come from. Make sense? Whatever the very first leaf that's going to emerge from is gonna have two of them. That's a dipot. One of them is a monopod. Huzzah. Make sense so far? Tends to be non-vascular, tends to be vascular. Not always. Make sense, guys? Cool. Pretty easy. Another way to tell. These veins, you guys have all seen plant veins before, right? You look at a leaf before and see the little veins running around in it. In a monopod plant, they always run in a straight line. You guys have all seen corn leaf before, right? The veins start one line, they go all the way to the other in a nice straight line. In our dipot, they are all over the place. You guys have seen leaves before, right? They're all over the place. There's no, it's a net. Okay. By the way, the little leaf, the nets and things, the veins are the xylem that carry the seed around and form it. Very special. Cool. Pretty neat, huh? All right. Cool so far. And another big difference to tell these guys apart. If you yank one of these up out of the ground, how many of you guys have ever yanked up grass? And its root system is about how big? about that far, right? It's very most, maybe about an inch or two. Doesn't go down very far, and it's a lot of dicks. It's coiled up massive blocks, right? Cool. It's called a fibrous root system. You guys have ever seen bamboo grow in your house if you grow it in a little vase before? I do that a lot, I have one in my kitchen. You can see all the roots grow down, right? They go right out of the bottom of the plant. Cool. You guys ever yanked up a tree before? Yes. What's this tree look like? What's this root look like? Uh, they're spread out. Exactly, right? You've got, as Steve just said, one big giant at the bottom of our tree. You've got one big root that comes out of the middle of it. It's called a tap root. And then all the little roots go off the side of it. Make sense? Cool. Yeah, they out. Otherwise, it's going to destroy my fence. Yeah, they'll do that quite regularly. So, these are called axial roots. These are the ones that go underneath the ground. They suck up nutrients, they suck up water, they hold the tree firm. Cool? If you cut these, not a big deal. Make sense? If you cut the tap root, there's only one of them. If you cut the tap root, you kill the plant. Makes sense? That's essentially cutting off the entire system because nothing can get to it from there. Cool? So that's kind of the difference between the two. Cool on that? So, so far so good? Awesome, awesome. Okay. That's basically it. Cool? Now, one more little thing. Now, I'm not going to be too picky about this, but if you ever cut one of these things in half and you look at it, where is its vascular tissue going to be? And that's a big deal. If you're a dipod, you're usually going to be like a tree. Make sense? Which means your vascular tissues are going to be where? Where is the vascular tissues on our tree? I mentioned that already. Right underneath the edge, right? Right around the ring, right around the very edge. So your vascular tissues on a new dipod plant, you'll see them gathered up in little bundles. They're called vascular bundles around the very edge of the stem. And I'll show you guys what these look like in the computer. So far? Now our dice, our, our monocot plants, they're everywhere. 
And just so you'll see them, they're thin, just have vascular buns and we'll call it their ears. Cool. Looks kind of like a, I, I refer to this as a cheese pizza stuffed crust versus a pepperoni. Make sense? Get the part? And that's our root system. Plant. Yay, plant. Cool. Anything else you guys want to know about plants? Yes. What would a zero be? One more time. Well, uh, I actually haven't pulled up. I pulled up a specific plant because I was curious what it would be because it, it seems like it's a flowering plant. If you're on Wikipedia, it'll probably tell you. It's not Wikipedia. Yeah, if you go to Wikipedia on it, it'll probably tell you because it'll give you the taxonomic right down there. Wikipedia is a wonderful thing. <laughs> wonderful thing. Just don't use it for source. Um, they've done quite, okay, so I'm going to let you guys in on a little secret here. There have been millions of studies that have been done, not millions, but a couple, that have been done on Wikipedia to see how accurate it is. And for long established knowledge, something that people have known and it hasn't changed for 25, 30, 50 years, it's as accurate as every other thing on Twitter. They find error rates that are within the exact same acceptable ranges of well established encyclopedia Britannica, National Geographic, and things like that. But for what? Yeah. But for uh, for newly evolving information, things that change fluidly, don't trust it. Makes sense, guys. So th that's kind of the difference. Right there. So it, it's very reliable in things that are well established. So, no. Teachers just don't want to tell you all that. We use it. Too. So another way to tell them apart is basically how their flowers put together. Um, if you got parts in three or parts in four or five. Now I'm not going to care about that. No. Uh, so you tell them apart. I'm pretty so sure it's a dipod, but I think it's its own thing. It's magnolia ACE, which is its own little weird thing. I was just wondering what like, group it would fall into if it like, was sort of like a transition. Yeah, they're, they're their own little weird category. Let's see what they are. Um, they're angiosperms, so that is technically a true fruit. Um, and they, you know those little red seeds that they produce in the middle of them? Yeah. That's what you're going for there. Yeah. That's your seed. I just know because I cracked open a bunch of them because we just found out that we make those and we stratify them. So oh. I just wonder what that even classifies. Yep, they're they're monopot or sorry, uh, you die and they are angiosperms. So those are true fruits. Okay. True seeds, true seeds. Yeah, very strange. There's also quite a different quite a few uh, fruit systems. This is a very if you guys ever go into plants, Magnolia ACE is a weird group of plants and there's people will spend weeks talking about this entire group because it's just weird. So plants are very strange, they do some weird stuff. Cool. Um, there are quite a few plants that are highly toxic to you guys, but not just by eating them. There are quite a few that if you touch them, they will burn your skin off. Well, they're just, uh, just kind of weird. They're all in the tropical rainforest and stuff if you touch them. Um, there are plants that can move. This is kind of cool. They're called walking trees. They can walk around. I've heard of that. Yeah, they actually can move if it's too dry in their environment. Plants are very strange. Um, also, FYI, what's the first plant you guys associate with Wild West movies? Tumbleweeds, right? Where are those native to? I don't know. Russia. Russia. And they were brought here in the 1890s by a lady that made brooms. So they're not native here, and they wouldn't have been in any of your original lessons in the 1870s. Because they're right here. That's how they spread their seeds. That's how they spread their seeds around. They blow around the place. Place, but not seeds. Huzzah. Okay. Yeah, but that's another really interesting point. Um, um, question on that. It has a bunch of different... Uh, clady? Is that how you say it? Clay, clay? Yeah, C-L-A-D. Clay. It's got uh, tracheophytes, angiosperms, So tracheophytes are a uh, um, form of a uh, fern, I think. Trachids is another form of uh, vascular tissue. So plants get a lot more fun than what I'm, I'm, I'm getting you guys surface level. I'm going to go way deep in plants and go along. Um, anything else you guys want to know about plants? So basically in Austria, you guys also see why I kind of classify algae a little bit as plants? Because they basically work the exact same way as moss, but they reproduce underwater. So their sperm and eggs, instead of swimming around in the air or pollen, just swims around in the water. Makes sense? So they basically are plants. Cool so far. Awesome. Well, that's basically all I got. Um, if y'all want to take a look at any of the herbarium specimens, I'll show you guys a little bit of these real fast. Um, just because so hey, we did. This is lycopodium. This is also lycopodium. This is one of the very first plants that's ever thought to have evolved as a plant. Um, Polytrichum is another one. You guys can just see there's just nothing to it. Makes sense, guys. We have fossil evidence of these that are very limited, so there's not a lot of fossil records to support this this one. But it just kind of makes sense if you think about it. Makes sense. Very simple. Very, very simplistic plant. Basically all there is to it. The next one I'll show you guys is real 
fastest is Equivitum. You guys have seen these a bunch. It's a very common um, um, landscaping plant. Give me, give me that five more minutes. Is that the ones with like the feathery uh, tendrils that come off? Yeah, give me, give me five minutes, guys. I'll show you some cool stuff. But I'll show you guys some stuff you can refresh your friends with because you'll see this all the time. Cool. Um, so, very, very, very common landscaping plant. You see it all the time. You guys, seen, you guys have seen this everywhere. This is the only existing genus in it. I think there's like three species of this, okay? Um, there used to be billions of them. This is essentially a very, very primitive plant. Um, if you guys zoom into it, you can kind of see the little leaves. See the tiny little little leaves around it? Very, very, very small plant. Um, but it's actually made of glass, which is cool. If you take the pieces of it and rub them together, it sounds like glass because the edges of it are coated in silica. It sucks silica out of the environment, out of the soil, and uses it in its cell walls. Um, and people a long time ago used to call these scouring rushes, if you guys have ever read uh, old uh, Western books and stuff in the 1800s, because they used to watch people wash their dishes. They'd go grab a handful of it and scrub their dishes clean, scour the dishes clean, which is kind of cool. So this is a horsetail, if you guys have ever heard of horsetail. Um, horsetails also, we have fossil evidence of them that were about that big. Yeah, they were huge. They're 15, 20, 30 feet tall. So they're quite large. Um, realistically, guys, uh, I'm just trying to show you guys some neat plants. Um, yeah. So this is what the original plant on the planet uh, is supposed to have looked like. It's called a whisk fern, Silotum. Um, very, very primitive plant. You can see there's just nothing to it. It doesn't even have leaves. It produces spores up at the top. Makes sense, guys, with the little yellow ball. And you guys have all seen the old pictures and old timey videos where the guys make the pictures and they hold that box up and go poof. That's what was inside it. Those yellow spores from this particular plant. People would just go harvest it. And I don't know how they figured that out. Um, but it's called Silotum flat powder. And that's what they would actually put in them. That's kind of another little thing. They probably accidentally got some fire too close to it. Yeah, I assume that happened a lot. Back in the days, people just blew up and disappeared. Yeah. So what's a Venus flat powder? Venus flat I'm not exactly sure. I think that's an angiosperm, but let's look. They're actually native to the United States, which is cool. And you can find them native in North Carolina. Um, if you guys want to go look around, in, uh, they're all over Virginia and North Carolina, native. These particular, this is the only place they're found, which is actually super cool. I had no idea they were native to the United States. Um, so are pitcher plants, which is cool. Um, they're angiosperms, yeah, they flower. So they're flowering. Are pitcher plants native to the United yeah. States? Yeah, they're just small though. Yeah, we have tiny ones, we don't have very big ones, but they're, they're mostly in the Smoky Mountains. Um, yes, we have all kinds of cool stuff here. And what these guys do, is they don't necessarily need this, um, but what they will do is when they catch those bugs and stuff, um, is they suck the nitrogen out of them. Um, a lot of the places that these guys live is they live in soils that are low in nitrogen, and they supplement the nitrogen from the soil by eating things. So they're still producing chlorophyll and yeah. doing normal plant stuff. Not but they lack extra nitrogen from yep. the yeah, yeah, they lack the nitrogen from the soil. Yep. So they're just as photosynthetic as every other plant, but they're just the red part time. Um, and the way they work is you guys can see the little hairs inside of them. That's the trigger portion. So what happens is these little traps can realistically only work once or twice at the very most. And they're powered by stored up cellular energy and water power. Cool. So they only have enough energy for about two closes. So a little an animal um, or water droplet falls on these things all the time, right? Water, how do you know it's not uh, a bug? So we don't want to waste our time closing on water. So what has to happen is see the little hairs? An insect or something has to trip two of those hairs within a certain amount of time period for the uh, plant to close on it. Um, if it trips just one and then another one three or four seconds later, it won't close. Um, and then once it closes, it won't open up again until three or four days later, and then it only has enough power to close maybe one more time, and then the little part will die and fall off. And if they don't eat, the entire plant can die, which is also strange. So they do have to eat them. They are, as you can see, they're highly uh, endangered, mostly due to the habitat. Fun. Don't ever go extinct because people keep them as pets, but the difference is you don't want them to go extinct in the environment. You guys know about the axolotl? You guys know about them? Yeah, yeah, so they're only found in one lake in Mexico, and they're not there anymore because we harvested all of them for the pet trade and the genetic research uh, thing. That's basically where they were, we harvested them all for. They only live in, like I said, one little lake. We went and caught them all because we can whack their legs off and they grow them back. And then you can cut off their tail and they grow it back. And if we could figure out how to make y'all do that, that'd be awesome. 
So we harvested all of them in, for the pet trade or for the genetic research, and now they're extinct in the environment because of people pollution and over harvesting. They're not there anymore. So that's what's going to happen to these guys. Cool. Plants are one of those very interesting things. The vast majority of plants that you guys see in your environment are probably invasive, and you guys probably didn't even know that. It's kind of cool. Interesting? Awesome. Don't plant Bradford pear trees. They smell awful anyway. They do smell horrible. Um, and that's what they call them. Calorie, cannery, calorie pears is the other name for them. If somebody wants to plant those in your house, do not do that. They only live about 30 years. They fall apart. They're highly invasive. The pollen is absolutely useless for bees because they make honey out of it, and it just has no nutrients inside of it. So it's just useless tree because they fall apart when the planet gets uh, from the outside. Cool. And they're exceptionally good at being invasive and spreading the seeds and nectar and stuff. Yeah, don't plant those. They fall out cars a lot. Yeah, they do all the time. They're part That's all I got, guys. Anything you want to turn me in, go ahead and turn me in. If not, so it should be online for you. I like to turn by the way. I just saw that they're on TikTok now. I just saw that today. They, they, they made an official TikTok account for Let's Up. Yeah, I haven't seen it. I don't have a TikTok. I just saw it on the news. Old things tend to be strange. The older something is, the weirder it tends to be. It, or, or, or maybe not as weird, the more newer things tend to be weird. Yeah, magnolias are just a, they're a very stereotypical phylum of plants. And then everybody in them sits in high school and defines what they should be. So it's not one of those like arthrotis where you might look this way, but somebody else that's in the same family is totally different. In magnolias, everybody really beautifully lined up in their nice little thing. And that's why people like to see stuff in so much. Because it's, it's all the same. Everybody aligned up. It's a smell because our neighbor has a really big one, and all of a sudden it started making all kinds of stuff. Yep. Yeah, those, those big white flowers, right? Yeah. That's the flower part. And that's the interesting thing inside of this one. Yeah, that's the big, that is flower. I just, we never knew about, like, the cones. That's the thing. Yeah, they're very strange little, little bit. Um, in, so, essentially how that one works is you've got, in some plants, since there are apples, they have, you know, six seeds, so three ovaries. Can I just plant? Yeah. So they have three ovaries on either side. On your magnolia tree, it's got thousands. Yeah, so that's why you got so many red seeds, because it's got way more. What the hell? Yeah. 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 The videos are all online for you to watch. Anything you want to do, just do it. Bring it in, turn it into me. At any point in time, I'll be happy to take it. 